we debate about what, what's next. So this is a session called The Struggle for Palestine Empowerment Strategies. We will have five different perspectives on different topics from five distinguished speakers that will be introduced by our moderator. Our moderator for this session is Butayna Hamda. Butayna is a research associate at the Center for Islam and Global Affairs here at Istanbul Dain University, where she researches issues related to Muslim communities in the United States. Before joining SIGA, Butayna served as a leadership assistant and development associate at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. She's also served in other consulting capacities to several nonprofits, and prior to that, spent time in community organizing and youth engagement in her hometown of Toledo, Ohio. Butayna obtained her Bachelor of Arts and Master's of Arts degrees in Political Science from the University of Toledo in Ohio. A graduate thesis focused on liberalism and its impact on religious identity in the American Muslim context. Please welcome Butayna and the rest of the panel. Assalamu alaikum, good afternoon. I will be chairing this session titled The Struggle for Palestine Empowerment Strategies. Since I last visited Palestine, what I found most important is the connection between the sentiment of resistance in Palestine and its translation into action through a multitude of vehicles, whether through the media, NGOs, coalition movements and alliances, cultural initiatives, the boycott divestment sanctions movement, or the academy and universities. How do we evaluate the efficacy of these vehicles? Moreover, how do we negotiate the cross-sections of activist movements, whether the roles of youth, women, faith-based movements, and secular movements, differing ideologies and contrasting visions. As the struggle increasingly gains recognition and legitimacy, and as the American media, for instance, has problematized the Zionist lobby in an unprecedented fashion, as activist coalitions worldwide take up the Palestinian cause as emblematic of common struggles, and as BDS continues to gain traction and victories, we find ourselves grappling more than ever with critical questions surrounding organizing and empowerment strategies. We hope this panel will address some of those challenges. So without further ado, I extend a welcome to our esteemed panelists. We're joined by Dr. Slah Jed, one of the founders of the Women's Studies Institute at Bejazet University and a Women Affairs Technical Com Committee, a national coalition for women. She has published many works on Palestinian and Arab women's political participation and political development. Dr. Jed obtained her PhD in Gender and Development from the Department of Development Studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, in 2004. She is a senior researcher on gender issues in the Arab region and Palestine, and has done many consultations for different Palestinian ministries, international organizations, and NGOs. Dr. Jed is an associate professor working in the Cultural Studies Department and the MA program on gender and development at Bidizayat University in Palestine. Next, I welcome Dr. Lubna Fatami, who is a President's Postdoctoral Fellow in the Department of Ethnic Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Her research concentrates on Palestinian youth movements. Lubna received a BA in Sociology and an MA in Ethnic Studies, Arab and Muslim Ethnicities and Diasporas Initiative from San Francisco State University. She also holds a Doctor of Philosophy from the Department of Ethnic Studies at the University of California, Riverside. Lubna is a contributing member of the Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network, and a founder, member, and former international general coordinator for the Palestinian Youth Movement. Next, I'd like to introduce Ms. Rowana Zaman, who is a filmmaker and media consultant, and the CEO and founder of String Media Consultancy. She produced and directed more than 30 hours of documentaries, including the award-winning series in Mecca. As a senior commissioning producer at Al Jazeera Media Network for 10 years, she worked with dozens of filmmakers. She founded and led Palestine Remix, the largest visual interactive website on Palestine. She holds an MA in Communication Studies from Leeds University in the UK. Next, Dr. Nomzi Bahut is a US Arab journalist, media consultant, author, internationally syndicated columnist, editor of the Palestine Chronicle, former managing editor of the London-based Middle East Eye, former editor-in-chief of the Brunei Times, and the former deputy managing editor of Al Jazeera Online. 
Baruch also serves as head of Edgezira.net's English Research and English Research and Studies Department. His latest volume is The Last Earth, a Palestinian Story. Baruch holds a PhD in Palestine Studies from the University of Exeter and is currently a non-resident scholar at the Urfani Center for Global and International Studies, University of California, Santa Barbara. And last but not least, Mr. Frank Baha is a human rights activist, journalist, and author based in Brussels. He was the coordinator of the Russell Tribunal in Palestine and is now the president of the Palestine Legal Action Network. His books include Gaza in Crisis, On Palestine, Corporate Complicity in Israel's Occupation, and Freedom is a Constant Struggle. Frank has written for The New Internationalist, The Palestine Chronicle, ZMAG, Counterpunch, Washington Report on Middle East Affairs, and other publications. Joining me in welcoming our panelists. I welcome Dr. Zlafja to speak on the role of women in the struggle for Palestine. First, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Uh, uh, Sammy and all the, team, the wonderful team uh, who organized this uh, very stimulating and interesting uh, conference. Uh, since I am giving 15 minutes, I will use my time, try to use my time efficiently. Uh, my presentation, unfortunately, it's not really about empowering, but I'm detailing the process of disempowering of the Palestinian women's movement. And why is that? It's because at the end I draw some conclusion that might be helpful uh, for building a future uh, strategy. Uh, in order to trace the history and trajectory of Palestinian nationalism and women's activism, I noted that the foundations of class and rural urban cleavages were created by the policies of the, the British mandate between 17 and 48, exactly the same process that is taking place under the Israeli occupation and also under the Palestinian Authority policies. These policies were built upon and aggravated by the Zionist settler state. Under colonial uh, rule, modernization, and the national education that it introduced enabled male elites to forge ties with their rural counterparts, uh, but not women. And uh, why is that? Because women were uh, uh, confined in, in their uh, institutional education uh, that was not Arabized as the main institution. So they were not able to transcend their class boundaries as males did uh, in urban centers in Palestine during the mandate period. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, but in general, while Palestinian nationalism constructed women as uh, auxiliary and marginal, it also opened up a new space for women in the public sphere, thus regarding women's status, nationalism, unleashed both rep repressive and emancipatory tendencies. The Arabization of the Palestinian cause, for example, uh, that was uh, reflected in the 38th uh, women of the East Conference in Cairo and later on in the Arab Women uh, uh, Conference also in Cairo in 1944 uh, was the result of women's activism in Palestine that pushed for the Sharawi at that time to adopt the, the, the Palestinian cause at the uh, uh, pan-Arab level. Success in mobilizing and organizing thousands of women was the ground upon which women activists built their claim to transform the gender order within their uh, parties and in their society at large. Uh, here's a picture of women leadership at that time. And we can tell from their clothes, you know, the class background they are coming from. Uh, the weakening of the Palestinian economy and its integration first into the Jordanian economy and later on uh, into the Israeli market has been one of the primary causes of women's marginalization in Palestine. As we saw this morning, the level of unemployment is always very high among Palestinians, especially among uh, educated uh, women in Palestine. Whether in the, West Bank, in the West Bank or in Gaza, in Gaza it reaches 51% as we saw this morning, in the West Bank it's 45%. Uh, <clears throat> 
So in, in this regard, contrary to trends in many third world countries and neighboring Arab states in particular, participation by Palestinian women in the labor force, especially in agriculture, uh, went into decline after the Israeli occupation in the West Bank and Gaza uh, that began in 1967, constituting the material basis uh, of Palestinian women's deepening dependency on men. I'm showing this, you know, I, I mean the macro uh, socio-political context, because when we call for women's equality or women's emancipation without really a material base for this emancipation, our call might fall uh, on deaf ears. Uh, despite these adverse conditions, women activism in Palestine affected the political structure they were affiliated with and society at large. After the military defeat of 67 and the subsequent formulation of Palestinian nationalism as in earlier instances did not develop a gender division. And I emphasize this point because there is now uh, a critique of the Islamist uh, movement that they don't have a gender uh, vision. And uh, by tracing the history of Palestinian national movement, uh, them too, they didn't have any gender vision, but women and women through their activism, they constructed their gender uh, agenda later on. However, the leftist party discourse on women's emancipation provided an important platform on which women activists were able to claim much greater space in the, in the public sphere. Women in the revolution succeeded in establishing constituencies among women in the KG camps in Lebanon. This constituted the basis for their claim for rights later on. And when I say that that was the basis for their claim of rights, because in uh, 81 they started to organize, to, to, to draft uh, uh, a specific um, a law, personal law for uh, women and men within the PLO. Uh, and they came up with a fantastic draft in uh, 1982, but unfortunately, they didn't have the time to uh, to apply this draft uh, because the, it, it, the expulsion of the resistance movement from uh, Lebanon impeded this initiative. So this shift repeats itself throughout the history of Palestinian national movement and women's movement. Every time they want to develop, you know, uh, some sort of gender agenda within the movement, and the national uh, issue uh, becomes very uh, uh, hot issue, it immediately, uh, you know, uh, uh, proves this initiative for later on. This was an iconic image representing women in the revolution. You know, this defying, uh, courageous uh, women involved in the uh, military activism. The emergence of a radical and popular local national leadership in the West Bank and Gaza after 67, removed from the direct authoritarian practice of the PLO, was an important step toward the development of strategy for, strategy for resistance based on people's initiatives and direct participation. It was in this context that grassroots women's organizations emerged in the mid-70s during which activists were able, for the first time in the Palestinian women's movement, uh, 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 to bridge the divide between urban middle class and rural women. I still, you know, I'm emphasizing this important uh, point because later on we will see uh, again, after, especially after the first uprising, uh, a shift uh, from uh, this, uh, you know, bridge gap between urban and rural women and refugee camp, uh, camp women to again uh, uh, the strengthening of uh, urban women in uh, urban centers through the working of uh, NGO. Through their activism, women managed to challenge the prevailing gender order and to develop a homegrown feminism that combined the national struggle with the struggle to change the prevailing gender uh, order. So, <clears throat> and this uh, photo might, you know, uh, give an idea about the kind of activists at that uh, at that time. 
the globalization of the contemporary secular uh, women's movement, and of course I use secular between quotation, and I will explain later on why I'm, I'm doing this, needs to be examined in the broader context of the formation of the Palestinian Authority after the signing of the Oslo Agreement in 1993 which uh, ushered in a phase of quasi-state building that proved illusory. The continuation of the Israeli occupation under the lease of the Oslo peace process resulted in the failure of the PA to establish Palestine as a state and caused uh, 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 the disintegration of the political structure of the PLO and its constituent political uh, parties. I'm saying that it established itself as a quasi-state because all the claims, to, uh, uh, all the moves, all the activism that developed after Oslo to claim women's rights from a state that has no sovereignty over its land, nor its people, nor its uh, uh, border. This led to the growing influence of the Islamic forces and the subsequent changes that took place in the components of Palestinian nationalism, which had uh, thus far been led by secularists, the emergence of the PA led to radical shifts in the different forms of activism in civil society. This aimed to sustain the Palestinian communities and to mobilize and organize them to resist the occupation. Where women were active participants in both these processes. Uh, to understand, you know, the shift to the so-called gender agenda uh, after Oslo and the emergence, the emerging of many uh, 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 women's NGOs, one has to understand the structure of uh, of aid to the Palestinians. And as we see from the structure, uh, far uh, to the right. The uh, quartet is the supreme power, you know, under which there are many administrative uh, levels, and these administrative uh, uh, levels, we have donors, we have Palestinians, we have Arab counterparts, and we have GOI. It took me nine months to understand what GOI stands for. No one could tell me what is GOI among all Palestinian bureaucrats I, I know of. And it turns out that GOI is the government of Israel on top of the aid structure for all Palestinian ministries. And the, uh, Israel is one of the uh, decision makers in these bodies to decide about what project should be implemented and what project should not be implemented. Oslo and the demobilization of women's movement, the decline that resulted in the decline of the General Union of Palestinian Women, and I will not bore you with the reasons for that, we can, we can discuss it later on. The Democrats or the move of most of the women leaders that shouldered the first Palestinian uprising through their uh, grassroots organizations, big part of them moved to serve as Democrats or feminist bureaucrats in the Palestinian uh, Authority and the disintegration of Fatah as uh, um, a social and political uh, movement and the continuous harassment of social, uh, so all social movements, especially teachers and uh, students. And of course, uh, the fruits of elections among these uh, bodies that uh, were part of the uh, PLO structure, especially the General Union of Palestinian Women. Uh, analysis of the brand feminism developed by NGO discourse, which is based on a universal rights approach, demonstrates how discourse in such a context is not simply a matter of words, but crucially involves frames uh, of collective action with uh, social movements as their power structure. The new discourse used by the NGO elite after Oslo might be seen to discredit all forms of organization and to co-opt popular groups. NGO discourse claims that legitimacy founded on resistance and sacrifice led to subordination and isolation 
of women which had to be challenged. Women NGOs belies the claim that NGO, NGOs are model, participatory, and inclusive agents for development. Furthermore, the emphasis on professionalism represented the interests of the prevailing, uh, the privileged few who sought to consolidate their own uh, power base. Thus, professionalism failed to enable the articulation and promotion of gender interests, whether practical or strategic, at the level of society uh, or uh, the state. And of course, the easy way here was uh, follow CEDAW and apply CEDAW, and everything would be okay for women, uh, which was not you know, uh, the case in the context of Palestine. Professionalism didn't lead to greater inclusion of target groups or broader participation in decision-making process for any project. The project's logic, as what I call, pushed toward vertical accountability rather than horizontal accountability. The project's logic places greater power in the hands of administrators, thus making NGO structure exclu exclusive rather than uh, in inclusive. And as I said, it revived again the urban center, the urban rural uh, divide. As donors are dri driven by the logic of the efficient deployment of their funds, NGO leaders uh, and staff experience pressure to, bro to prove their high level of, of professionalism. And when I say violence, violence everywhere, because uh, amid uh, this gloomy situation that we uh, have been uh, following since this morning, um, and you know the harassment and the settlements and the uh, terrible level of, of of Israeli violence, all the, uh, the the first strategic objective of, for example, the Ministry of Women's Affairs in the West Bank is how to fight the domestic violence. And here, violence was completely separated from its general uh, context. And the question of violence through this project and the huge channel of funding for issues related to uh, GBV or gender-based uh, violence uh, transferred the question of, of violence in, from a national issue into an, uh, an internal Palestinian issue uh, as represented in uh, the uh, you know, male chauvinism uh, or uh, Palestinian patriarchy. Uh, the link, uh, here I will skip this, and I will skip this because I still have uh, less than five minutes. Uh, I'm moving to say that uh, the visualization the, the of the gender agenda, uh, depending on you know the uh, the will or the objectives of the donors uh, also reached the uh, national agenda. It means that there was a huge amount of funds that were channeled to encourage the peace building between Israeli uh, women and Palestinian women, both united by the fight against patriarchy, irrespective of the dilemma of, their, uh, of the Palestinian national uh, and, uh, context. However, uh, in this respect, we, we, we see that uh, the leaders representing Palestinian women in this uh, international uh, forum that used to be used to speak about, uh, you know, the, the settler colonial project in Palestine moved to speak about how to come together to fight patriarchy and uh, chauvinism. The Islamist Islamist women forged a public space for a certain category of women, those who are educated for, from poor, uh, mainly refugee backgrounds. So I'm um, uh, detailing you know, the pr process through which the civil society activism leaves a huge space for a newcomer to activism in the Palestinian context. And here I spoke in details for the first time to, uh, about Islamist women uh, of Hamas who managed to attract uh, thousands of women uh, by uh, going back again to the old uh, national women's agenda, which is supporting the families and the, uh, per the people who are uh, the victims of the Israeli uh, project uh, in Palestine. Uh, of course, we heard about the schism uh, between both, 
Kitten uh, also touched upon, you know, uh, the relationship between women, especially after the winning of Hamas, uh, uh, the legislative uh, 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 election of 2006, and uh, uh, and the nomination for the first time of a women minister coming from Hamas in the Ministry of Women's uh, Affairs. The minister was beaten by nationalist women and rejecting her as a backward, conservative, religious, uh, uh, against all the, uh, the gender agenda developed by the women's movement. As I detailed before, the agenda was developed to some extent by the uh, donor uh, community. So, <clears throat> I have finished four. Uh, and of course, the critique, they, they also touched upon the Sharia as a guiding principle, not Sida. So, uh, Sharia here is seen as uh, a very conservative uh, and backward uh, set of uh, ideas. Uh, that cannot emancipate women in the Palestinian con context. Uh, is the Islamist women, uh, and here I studied, you know, their discourse and the, the evolution of their uh, gender vision, because Hamas as Fatah in the PLO did not have a gender agenda, but through activism, women were touching upon issues that women are suffering uh, from, whether issues related to violence or uh, lack of equality when it comes to issues uh, like custody or uh, like you know equal pay or or, or similar uh, similar issues. So at the beginning, the the, the 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 point was that they were rejecting totally any claims by the uh, secularist women. Uh, uh, you know, uh, claim of rights, that Islam gave women all rights, etc. And after that, the following year, they started to engage with what they are saying, and through engagement, they started themselves to develop their own vision about what should be a gender agenda for an Islamist women's uh, movement. Um, so the same debate on Sharia triggered internal soul searching within the Islamist movement itself, pressured by the feminist secularist women's group. The Islamists had to uh, present their own alternative vision based on Sharia. For this, they had to engage with the, 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 the opposition. In their discourse, they rejected and refuted the total equality approach. At the same time, highly educated and professional Islamist women were using total equality in their daily practice to defend equal rights for women in the public sphere, specifically in relation uh, to, to, okay, to work and political activism. Islamists, in their quest to define themselves as a national movement, borrowed from and incorporated new visions to broaden the revival of struggle, retain, and sacrifice women as givers and not takers. Because one of the formula that Islamist women used uh, was that uh, they portrayed the nationalist secularist women as takers from uh, a falling apart nation. They are claiming rights uh, from a state that they doesn't exist. Uh, they are claiming rights from a nation that is threatened in its existence, and this is not the moment to take from the nation. It is still the moment to give. Uh, so this is, you know, to go back to the mode order of the Palestinian national movement that uh, uh, built its uh, ident national identity on return, sacrifice, and, and struggle. So they uh, uh, recuperated these slogans again, and they formulated their agenda around these uh, issues, and they targeted, as I said, all people and families affected by the, by the uh, colonial Israeli uh, uh, policies. Here we see that the faces are becoming different. The leaders in the streets are, you know, Islamist women, and not as I showed before. And thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Dr. Jack. Next, I would like to offer the stage to Dr. Lubna Fatami to discuss the role of the youth. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking Dr. Sabi Manian and all the team at CEDA and all the people who are making this convening possible for us. I'm truly honored to be sharing the platform with esteemed colleagues and comrades and um, to be thinking and reflecting together on um, Palestinian liberation. Yeah. Franz Fanon, anti-colonial intellectual giant, once notes, Every generation must, at a relative obscurity, discover its mission and either fulfill it or betray it. Few words have hurt the Palestinians so deeply as the words peace process. The peace process, crystallized in the 1993 Oslo Accords, signifies for Palestinians the parceling of Palestinian land, the decimation of Palestinian rights, segmentation of Palestinian geographies and constituencies, and de-sutures of the social and political fabric of the transnational Palestinian nation, once organized by an umbrella known as the PLO. It also signifies the establishment of a complex neoliberal system of racial capitalism, all while under occupation, a racial capitalism that makes Palestine a debt-based economy, that makes the NGO expansion of Palestine create new tendencies in social and cultural life, tendencies of individualism. It signifies the proliferation of a national economic and political comprador class to act as the new gatekeepers to colonization, to stifle dissent from its peripheries and from its streets, to deepen its political, economic, and security coordination with our own colonial forces. Of course, that starts in 1993 and expands tremendously after 2007. It signifies the expansion of Zionist colonization, encroachment on lands, a more robust military militarization, and incurred violences on Palestinian land and life. And it signifies leaving behind five million Palestinian refugees to perish in camps in the region, experiencing catastrophes all over again by new wars. But a new generation was told that they should expect to revel in the fruits of statehood of the so-called rights of citizenry, citizenry and sovereignty. Instead, a new generation was left to shoulder the wounds and traumas of passed on generations, as well as their own. But they were also left with no institutional transition of liberation strategy, narrative, consciousness, training, organization. Parties were weakened. Heroes of the historic record killed, imprisoned, or becoming the new faces of the Palestinian Authority, policing Palestine's youth. Palestine became locked into a web of factionless division, especially after the 2006 parliamentary elections, in which the factionless division between Hamas and Fatah expands to become a territorialized division, creating new arbitrary definitions of Palestinian fragmentation inside, outside, Hamas, Fatah, Mawatan, Lajit. Oslo was a Nakba for the Palestinians. I've been asked today to talk about the role of Palestinian youth in Palestine, but I'd like to rather reflect on the quote that I introduced um, this talk with about Franz Fanon talking about each generation needing to discover its mission and either fulfill it or betray it. I wonder if we might think about how the particular positionality of Palestinian youth in the aftermath of the Oslo Accords, if we can reconsider what youth means, if it's not defined by an age bracket or by time, and we actually think of this particular position that the new generation is, is in comprehensively uh, across time and space, if new opportunities for liberation might become present for us. In order to do so, I'd like to reflect on the methodological process of youth organizing, and I want to share some reflections on two different generations. The first, what's known as Jil al-Thawra, or the generation of the revolution. The first, student and youth organizers in the aftermath of the 1948 method. And the second, 
what is dubbed SG in Oslo, or the Oslo generation. Uh, and particularly, I'll be focusing on the Palestinian youth movement. I'd like to start off by saying, uh, reflecting on Patrick Wolf's understanding of invasion being a structure, not an event. It's come up several times in the conference by Dr. Ilan Pape. If we understand invasion as a structure, and not an event, then maybe we can actually see that these two disparate generations of the 1950s and of the early 2000s actually shared very much in common. They were both attempting to overcome a void, a particular void, even though conditions had become very different, but a, a, a void nonetheless. In the 1950s, Abu Iyad, who would, was one of the first uh, Palestinian student organizers of the Palestine Student Union, later would become one of the founders of Fatah and a vital player in the political movement, the national liberation struggle. He talked about the Nakba as producing a quote unquote gap in our souls. If we were to think of the gap of our souls that Abu Iyad speaks of as an impulse for the something that's to be done, this is what the first thing that Palestinian students and youth were responding to in the 1940s, 50s, and early 60s. But the importance of what they were responding to is that they did not have a complete handle on what had just happened to them. The Nakba had produced a shock and trauma to Palestinian social, political, and cultural life. As I mentioned yesterday in a Q&A, Konstantin Zureyek said that one of the tragedies of the Nakba was that it produced a shattering of Palestinian society. People were left scattered, but their ideas were also left to roam. And so the importance of the original student pop, uh, organizers of the 1940s and 50s is that as they were trying to diagnose the Palestinian condition, they were simultaneously trying to develop methods out of that condition, strategies out of that condition, and political visions that could get them out of that condition, out of that position, all simultaneously. Gilles Thora, in responding to the gap in our souls, first started with the social needs of their constituency. In 1944, the Palestine Student Union in Cairo started organizing around student scholarships that were being revoked from Palestinian students. There they were learning the techniques of sit-ins, of civil disobedience, of protest, and were persecuted for it after 1948, with the first arrests happening from protest about students sitting in to protest scholarships being denied to them. But another important thing about the students is that they were diagnosing and articulating the experience, needs, and aspirations of the Palestinian masses and creating a narrative that organized the first iteration of the Palestine frame. This would become obvious in the PSU 1952 elections in which uh, presidential and vice presidential elections in which Yasser Arafat and Abu Iyad would run on a slogan of trying to define and create Palestinian self-reliance and Palestinian identity and exile, responding to the distrust that they had of Arab regimes and of the sense that Palestinian students needed to assume agency as history makers and as reconciling the damage that the Nakba had produced. They argued that they wanted to quote unquote put Palestine back on the map. They told this to their people in the refugee camps. They disseminated it in literature, newsletters, booklets. But they also used that slogan of putting Palestine back on the map to communicate the Palestinian struggle to the international community, to dispel the notions of Palestinians as bloodthirsty terrorists of Zionist character, to generate international solidarity with the Palestinian struggle, and to generate a place at the table with international struggles and movements across the world. They also served, Palestinian students also served as the interlocutors between, literally and theoretically, between the Palestinian masses and regional and global actors. The PSU, for example, would be the first Palestine student group to sit at the table in the International Union of Students backed by the Eastern Bloc. There they gathered strategies, resources, information on how they could develop their own anti-colonial struggle. Similarly, the experience of um, the 1951 presidential elections of the Urwa, Jamaiyat al Urwa al uh, George Habash runs for president as the student um, organization, and runs on the campaign slogan of wanting to turn the Palestinian cause into a struggle of mass mobilization, a popular struggle, a revolutionary struggle. These ideas and theories were informed by the literatures that they were reading, by the forums in which they were meeting students 
and political figures from across third world uh, anti-colonial struggles. But the Palestinians, uh, in, the, in the, creation of the, the creation of the Palestinian national uh, identity and national trajectory that was fomenting within the Palestinian student groups in the early 1950s, it also was complemented by their study of structures that would be suitable for their condition as a scattered and dispossessed people. They wanted to create a Palestinian national discourse, a structure and a strategy in which they could have a role in the liberation of their country and the return of all refugees, though they were not sharing a similar, a shared landmass amongst one another. In 1958, uh, Palestinian students in Iraq would learn about the general union model uh, from Abdel Karim al Qasim's uh, communist general union model that was spreading in Iraq. But by 1959, those Palestinian students had been experienced an exodus in which, uh, an exodus to Syria because they were accused of having uh, Ba'ath and Arab nationalist sensibilities. Their proposal of a joint federation for the different Palestinian groups between Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and Egypt had finally reached the PSU. And in 1959, the establishment of the General Union of Palestine students was created. The GUPS, which would later on become uh, the largest popular union of the PLO, the GUPS was the first iteration of a national democratic space of various Palestinian geographies and political ideologies. It was a space in which uh, an articulation of a national struggle was first fomented. I want, uh, not, not by coincidence, the very same years that the Palestinian parties are formed and as guerrilla insurgency is fomenting in the early 1960s. In, 1960, in GUPS's 1962 conference, they would resolve for the, that, they, that they believed in the creation of a Palestinian entity. In 1964, when the Arab nations created the PLO, or resolved to create the PLO, the GUPS was not happy. They argued that the PLO was comprised of Palestinian elites too agile to do anything about the conditions and too disconnected from the struggle in order to actually understand what the masses needed and wanted. Still, they maintained relations with the PLO, asked the PLO for resources and money, told them not to interfere in their own elections. Didn't feel that the PLO had held up their end of the bargain. By 1965, the GUP students, who at the time were comprised of an Arab nationalist majority in the executive committee, decided to host their own conference in Egypt in which they invited global actors from across the world, students and non-students, to talk about the relationship between Palestine, the region, and the African continent. There, they deepened their international solidarity, relationships, networks, and resources, alongside a brewing Fidetan movement and alongside, um, alongside uh, the development of the Palestinian parties. Fast forward, Gilles Oslo. In 2006, 30 Palestinian youth from across Europe and the Arab region and in Palestine gathered in Barcelona, Spain to discuss the current status of the Palestinian liberation movement. There, they talked about the necessity to create some sort of form and order to Palestinian social and political life, ruptured by the Oslo Accords. They talked about their grievances with the Palestinian political establishment 13 years after the Oslo Accords and Palestinian parties were fighting each other. Israel became increasingly obsolete. The occupation, though expanding, was nowhere in the discussion of Palestinian political concerns. But they were also responding to a new phenomenon in Palestinian political life, the, curb, the curbing depoliticization of Palestinian youth through the NGO sector that treated Palestinian troubles as geographic aberrations or as a problem of cultural deficiency that did not recognize a political colonial history. The youth wanted to reorient the role of the Shatat. The Shatat are still Palestinian. They must have a role in the national struggle. They are not solidarity activists. They are not humanitarian aid workers. There's only so much work that we can do to expose Israel, but what is our, our, our alternative? Between 2006 and 2010, the PYM came to, engage, uh, came to produce over two, th over two dozen meetings, conferences, focus groups, campaigns, summer schools, and summer camps. During those years, they were diagnosing the struggles of the new generation, the assets of the new generation, and their aspirations for freedom, justice, and liberation. 
By 2009, the PYM had recognized that the biggest crisis affecting Palestinian youth was a crisis of identity, a crisis of authenticity competitions, oppression Olympics, and delegitimization amongst one another based on factionalist divisions, ideological divisions, geographic, social, and cultural divisions, similar to what we'd heard in the panel earlier this morning. But by 2009, the PYM decided to contribute an entire program, a one month long summer program in, the, in Damascus, in which they would come together to discuss, what the to discuss what a collective Palestinian identity in the contemporary context was. That program led to the, to the first major uh, program of the PYM in 2010 in the Basque country in Spain, where they would identify their first post-identity politics articulations. They stopped talking about identity as being something natural, as Palestinians being naturally bound to one another and to the land, and started to foment more serious political ideas and principles. In 2011, in April of 2011, the PYM would meet for its second International General Assembly here in Istanbul. And there, they would change their name from the Palestinian Youth Network to the Palestinian Youth Movement and adopt a new structure, a structure similar to the structure of the Guts in 1959 a transnational umbrella for youth movements who will come from different geographic and ideological backgrounds to develop iterations of a national trajectory for, for uh, the liberation of Palestine. But by 2011, all of the planning that the PYM had done had changed because of the Arab uprisings. Um, one of the things that the PYM had talked about at the time was creating analytical tools and principles, not positions, and ideas, not ideologies, that that was a necessary component in order to bring together Palestine's fractured transnational nation. But by that time, in trying to articulate more clear political principles, youth groups who were part of the uh, political parties felt that they could not participate in the PYM. Calling itself a movement meant that it was a new party in competition with other political parties, with the establishment. PYM continued to develop its trajectory, at the time realizing that the most important thing that it needed to do was start focusing, quote unquote, on the ground. Transnational convenings, bringing together Palestinian youth from different organizations and factions was not as important anymore now that a general framework has been built for the PYM. What was important were bases on the ground that could mobilize the masses, that could create a new revolutionary consciousness in Palestinian society that can allow us to overcome the hardened forms of fragmentation that exist within Palestinian society. But at the time, there were other matters at, at, of concern for the PYM. The Arab uprisings required the PYM to actually have positions, though the PYM was not in a position to have position, was not in a position to have positions, the Arab street demanded it of them. And so PYM decided to focus on the Arab context at that time, to take a step away from the Palestinian context. Why? Because in 2011, as the Arab region was overcome with revolutionary zeal by its youth, Palestinian youth were, were rising up in Palestine to call for an end to the split in national unity, to call for an end to security cooperation between the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli security apparatus. And simultaneously, the Palestinian Authority was going to the United Nations to bid for statehood, started in 2011, but officially at the end of 2012. So here's the paradox, the moment that there's a revolutionary moment happening in the Arab region, the Palestinians are actually calling for restabilization of the existing status quo, a false pretense of a state with its bureaucracy, with its responsibility, but without any of the rights and freedoms in order to actually guarantee Palestinian liberation of land and life. In 2012, the PYM hosted one of its most monumental gatherings, the Arab Youth for Dignity and Liberation Conference in a newly liberated Tunisia with a conference uh, sponsored and supported by the president. That moment was vital for the PYM. We were asking the question of the relationship between Palestine and the Arab region, the incomplete Palestinian revolution and new prospects for liberated region, for, the, for liberation within the region. But the isolation that the PYM experienced in the Palestinian national scene 
limited their abilities to actually partake in the Arab region. Without, in the absence of positions on the divisions happening within the broader region, and in the absence of coalitional spaces and bases on the ground that could sustain the fractures that the Arab uprisings had created. In the years following, the PYM experienced an immense internal crisis. I share these reflections on the methods, challenges, ambitions of Palestinian youth of two disparate generations to talk about the ways that Palestinian youth are considering organizing as a central component to the Palestinian struggle. Our struggle is not one that can just be won with the war of words or with the social media post. We are scattered, dispossessed, and under an increasingly robust, violent military occupation. But how do we get out of the difficulty and the deadlock of our own political establishment? Well, in my final thoughts, I'd like to share a couple reflections of the opportunities and challenges in this current time, some years after the Arab uprisings. First, we must come to think of youth not as a sector of society any longer. We must come to think of youth as a political optic, one that is uh, ripe with uh, revolutionary tenets for, uh, for liberation. And if we can do that without separating the current generation from past generation struggles, if we can find a way to understand how youth can learn from past generations, how there can be a more robust intergenerational conversation on organization, then we might be able to do so. As Dr. Rabah Abdul Hadi mentioned this morning, in order to do that, the imaginations of hope, or the imaginations of possibility is critical. Everything in Palestinian youth, uh, everything in the world of Palestinian youth today tells us that we cannot dream, that we cannot hope, that we cannot envision possibility. And those limitations, those imminent limitations, prohibit us from actually being able to devise a plan to get out of our situation. Second, the changes since the Arab uprisings. Today, Palestinian youth share more common sense ground about our current political conditions than the PYM youth did in 2006. Palestinian youth have shared articulations, common sense shared articulations about the problems in Palestinian political life. There's a shared acknowledgement of the void of any liberation project on the table in which youth can actively partake. There's a shared articulation of how that void is actually filled with a crowded, uh, with crowded gatekeepers. There's a shared articulation of the shifts from political despair to rising up on all levels. In 2006, we were trying to figure out how we can rise up. Today, Palestinian youth are rising up everywhere and on all levels prisoners on hunger strike, and it's not just for Palestinians, it's for all Palestinians. Prisoners on hunger strike, artists, cultural workers, people within uh, boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement in the Farsh Hadath. On all levels, there is an insurgency of Palestinian youth activity. But the challenge is, we are less organized than we were even 10 years ago. The new generation is less is less, uh, has less familiarity with organizational structure and organizational history, less able to accumulate upon political gains, and less familiar with what it means to build institutions and operate in institutions that foster collective accountability and collective politics. Because of this, new Palestinian generations are initiating knowledge projects across Palestine and across the Arab region and in the Farsh Hattat. These knowledge projects are looking at history, at different experiences of Palestinian political parties, of the experiences of the different student groups, and different phases in history to think about how we can accumulate upon our history, rather than acknowledging and allowing for the Oslo Accords to be another Nakba segmenting us from history. I'd like to end uh, with a quote by Ahmed Diab, who talked about the catastrophe that happened in Yarmouk camp in Syria. He says, rather than enduring, existential crisis. Palestinians learn to deal with existence as crisis. This is the stuff of nation building. And Palestinian youth today, through the crises that they're enduring, through the catastrophes that they're enduring, are trying to build their nation. Thank you very much.
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, I'm very glad to be here today. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's not an easy job to be the third speaker in a session of the afternoon session of five speakers, but I am really honored to be with such great five speakers, Islah, Lubna, Ramzi, and Frank, and really honored to be amongst all of you, dear friends and colleagues who are passionate about Palestine and what we can do today. Uh, I'm really thankful for uh, SIGA, Isa University, and the sponsors, Dr. Sami Aryan and his team, Fadi, Linda, Riyad, Butayna, Imad, Yunus, everybody who is trying to make this happen today. Our session with the title, The Struggle for Palestine Empowerment Strategies, I'm speaking today about the media in particular. Palestine creating a media strategy. In the aim of one of the main aims of this conference, to empower people in Palestine and around the world toward realizing the essential elements for resolving the conflict and achieving the vital, vital goal of justice, freedom, inclusion, and lasting peace. My name is Rawan Dalman. I'm a Palestinian filmmaker and media consultant. And this is me in the digital world filming and trying to do something in the media for Palestine. I was born in Amman, Jordan, to a Palestinian family and raised as a kid that I am Palestinian. And as a kid in the school, I worked with my sister for six years on oral history books, where we published two books on the oral history of Palestine. Uh, the second was The Expulsion in the Memory of Children, published in 1997 with tens of stories from people who were kids in 1948 between the age 8 and 16. Later, we participated in a chapter on this book in a teen's life in the Middle East book. But at that time, when I was at school, this is how media looks like. I remember these TVs, radios, and newspapers. Most of you here, maybe only the undergraduate students, won't recognize these media things. <laughs> And this is when I entered Birzeit University in Palestine, where I did my undergraduate in media and sociology. I was in Birzeit only last week, spending three weeks as a voluntary teacher for the media courses there. And I, talking to the undergraduates here at ESA University, utilize your every moment at the campus of any university. And here you are lucky to have such a wonderful campus and a wonderful library as well. I remember spending many, many hours at Birzet Library, and the librarians there, till now they are there, they remember this girl that was reading all the time. At that time, I discovered the first pillar of what I would suggest today as the media strategy for pillars. And the first is to produce things. We lack content on Palestine in different languages including also Arabic, but also in English, Spanish, French, German, Italian. And at BZ, I did my first mini documentary, Waiting for Light. It's available on YouTube. Everything I mention in this presentation is available on YouTube. It's a 10 minutes documentary done in the Easter time, like this time, 18 years ago in 2001, on a Christian family in Palestine, not allowed, they live in Ramallah and not allowed to go to the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem to celebrate Easter. And the film was on VHS at that time. I sent it to Milano Film Festival in Italy. And at that time, I got an email on the old Yahoo email, Gmail and Google did not exist. And the email looked like this. It was April, like this month, but 2001. And I got this email from somebody whom I didn't know named Benjamino Sabeni. And he said, it's a long time that we are looking for contributions from young Palestinian authors, and are really happy that finally someone answered to our call. Every year they get at least two films from Israel. And at the end, there's a note. I personally take the occasion to express my solidarity to your people and to its eternal struggle for its country. So dramatic in these days. I would be happy to give any help if needed. Don't give up. It meant a lot to a 22 years old girl at Birzeit University graduating at that time. And I decided that this is what I will do for the rest of my life, to use media as an empowerment tool and strategy for Palestine. 
And I was lucky to be among the generation where we got YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Google, and all of this appeared at that time. I felt that we can have the whole world at the tips of our fingers. And this led me to the second pillar of this strategy, that is to make it accessible. It's not enough to produce things, but now it's much easier and cheaper to make it accessible. I was working with schools at that time and was asking Palestinian girls who are the Palestinian role model of women. And I was surprised that they don't have role model of current Palestinian women. And this is why I decided to do my first series on women pioneers. And I chose two Palestinians. One is Mrs. Tamam al-Akhal, who has been drawing for Palestine for the last 60 years. This is one of her drawings. She was expelled from Jaffa in 1948 when she was 14 years old. And she drew with her late husband, uh, Ismail Shamut, uh, wonderful pictures and drawings for Palestine. And this was my first documentary of two hours available only in Arabic. And the second is Salma al-Khadra Jayusi, who is famous in the West much more than Palestine and the East, because she translated 40 books from Arabic to English, and including modern Palestinian literature and novels. After doing those stories, I understood that our problem is with Al-Nakba narrative. That's the main thing that we need to work upon. And I started saying that Al-Nakba did not start in 1948 and did not end in 1948. Dr. Ilan Papa mentioned this morning the 1882 as the first time of the formal Zionism coming to the shores of Palestine. But in my Al-Nakba series, a four hours documentary available in 10 different languages on YouTube now, Spanish, Italian, French, English, German, even the sign language, including, of course, Arabic and English, I started from 1799 until today. And why I was amazed that many Palestinians, when they talk about Al-Nakba, they get this symbolic old woman in front of the tent or the key. And I hated this. I didn't like it at all. This is not our Nakba. And I decided that I use this always as a symbol of Al-Nakba. And people get surprised. Is this the Palestinian Nakba? Yes, it is. Those boys were part of the Orthodox Jaffa school in Palestine in 1938. And as mentioned on the image itself, it was taken on the 15th of June, 1938. And at that time, I imagine those kids telling each other that we will have a reunion 10 years from now will come again to our school and have a picture exactly like this one in our school. But 10 years later, in June 1948, the school is still there until today, but none of them is in Jaffa, and none of them can even visit their school. This is the Palestinian Nakba. This is what happened in 1948. It is available in Turkish language also, so I would like the Turkish people to watch Al Nakba in Turkish language. And the most after al nakba that I was very touched with is the Palestinians inside Israel, whom I found that their story of Palestinian Israelis is very complicated. They themselves even are not able to tell it in a very straightforward way. And I spent two years reading everything they wrote about themselves. I'd like to show you only one minute from this. because they are 
And I'm very glad that Dr. Mohammed, who was part of this series when he was doing his PhD at that time, of part of this series. I think also it's very important when we want to produce and make it accessible is to study the Oslo, which was mentioned many times this morning and yesterday. But yet, to understand it, we need to understand the Egypt-Israel relation. And this is why there's one hour documentary that I did called The Bitter Peace, which is only archive and narration telling the story of first Camp David. Let's watch one minute of this archive. We came to Camp David with all the goodwill and faith we possess. And we left Camp David a few minutes ago with a renewed sense of hope and inspiration. The Camp David conference should be renamed. It was the Jimmy Carter conference. <laughs> as far as my historic experience is concerned, I think that he worked harder than our forefathers did in Egypt building the pyramids. which is a two hours documentary telling what happened really in 1993. As Dr. Hanel Masri mentioned in the session before the lunch, the story started in 1974, and this is when the film really starts, because the 1993 did not start at that time. But during the nine months, from January until September 1993, the Norwegian Foreign Ministry paid the whole expenses of the whole negotiations, having the Norwegians, Israelis, and Palestinians in Norway secretly. But till today, there is not a single document of a one minute of meetings from those negotiations of nine months, even not a single image, even not a single video. And this makes our narrative very complicated. We don't have any document, any still, any video, and we are supposed to produce and make it accessible for our people to understand what happened. It is also available in Turkish language and Spanish and English. Producing 10 documentaries on Palestine, and I was privileged to work with Al Jazeera Media Network in Doha, Qatar for 10 years as a senior commissioner. And I commissioned 250 documentaries, 80 of them on Palestine. And at that time, I discovered the third pillar of our strategy that we need to work with is to advocate and use this material. And this is when we launched what Buteyna mentioned in the beginning of the introduction, Palestine Remix, palestineremix.com which I was lucky to work with a wonderful team of freelancers and employees of Al Jazeera Network to create it. This is the main page in English and in Turkish. It's available in Arabic, English, Turkish, Bosnian, and also recently in Spanish. And the main idea of Palestine Remix that I was always telling my friends and colleagues like you to watch Al Makba four hours, Owners of the Land five hours, Bitter Peace one hour, and The Price of Oslo two hours. And then we we'll meet again in a year or a couple of years, and I discovered that none of them watched the documentaries. And so I said, we need to find another way to get people into those documentaries. And the idea was to get excellent documentaries from different directors around the world, like Gaza, we are coming for a Greek director on breaking the siege on Gaza, going against the grain about Gideon Levy and how he was transformed to be against Zionism, hunger strike, on the Palestinian prisoners in the Israeli prisons, all available in the different languages, stronger than words, which I use always about the deaf community in Gaza Strip. It's all in sign language, the pain inside, on the new Israelis, the young Israelis who after the mandatory of the military service go to India or to Berlin, and what they say about the Zionism project and Israel. All those documentaries are available both in the video and in the text which means it's searchable. 
you can write there the word Jerusalem and reach to every single place Jerusalem was mentioned within the documentaries, as the documentaries are on YouTube like a black box. But then you can go within those documentaries and find an extract, one minute from any documentary, mix and match with another extract from another documentary and build your own story and share it on social media. Even download the file and use it in your university class or in your PowerPoint for your students. And we managed to get Palestine Remix as an educational tool in many universities around the world, especially in America and Europe, in East Asia and in the Arab world, and we are having for the last five years around 1,000 new visitors every month from the students themselves, undergraduates and postgraduates. Al Shabaka, Ala Tartir has been using it for a long time in Holland as well. And so it's available in Arabic, in Bosnian, and in Turkish. All the documentaries about Palestine. Recently, we did all of them in Spanish, and they are available on YouTube. And for the last three years, working as a freelance, I was thinking, what's next? We had to advocate things, we had to market things more. But is there anything new we need to produce? And I found out that, yes, animation is a big thing. We need, as Palestinians, to be there. And this is why we did a seven minutes animation in both Arabic and English called the Balfour-like declaration which we used as the story of Palestine for the kids at schools from 1799 until today, and as well as virtual reality, 360. We did with the team in Jerusalem stories about the life inside Jerusalem in 360 virtual reality. I wouldn't need to tell you how many Zionist projects are there in the virtual reality and how rarely you have the word Palestine even in an index for the virtual reality. But to do this, to produce, to make it accessible, and then to um, advocate is not enough. We need to network. There is some experiments that we did with the International Forum for Palestinian Media and Communication. With, we, we were very happy to have Dr. al Aryan in our last conference attending here in Istanbul. We have been doing this conference every two years, once in Istanbul. And we launched also the Media Creativity Award for Palestine, which I initiated and I was a jury member last year, trying to convince Palestinians, pro-Palestinians, to do creative work for Palestine, not only to do work for Palestine. And later I discovered, not like as a kid, when I was so fascinated that we have for the first time YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram later, and Google, I discovered that as a kid, they are all as the monopoly we were playing when we were children. They are monopolies, and they are also tools that the Zionist project use also to suppress our voice. But we are the one person in the red color. We can do something, and we should. And this is why what I suggest for this conference maybe and for other uh, organizations connected to the conference is to use the Palestine, the Palestine media strategy for key co goals. The first is producing evidence, to produce and continue to produce high quality, re relevant, long shelf, up to date, systematic print, audiovisual, and interactive digital material based on in depth research and clear evidences to inform. Many of our media about Palestine is news-oriented and not long-shelf, and this is a real problem. And the second goal is making our evidence accessible. To make it accessible and useful to everybody, every world in the world, to utilize the huge content we have available for different audiences, different content based on language, age, and interest. Advocate for this evidence to use this media con content widely in all our gatherings, conferences, platforms, discussions. This is really a problematic issue. Many people in this hall do not know that this content do exist, although they are interested about Palestine. To market it and become informative, entertaining advocates for evidence-informed decisions on Palestine. To build an effective and sustainable networking body. To be a diverse, inclusive, and transparent international networking body that effectively harness the enthusiasm and skills of our people to make optimal use of our media resources. Nowadays, you don't need to be a media person to be part of the media strategy, whether you can produce, 
or make it accessible or advocate using it or be part of the network. Any of us in this hall and all over the pro-Palestine can be part of a media strategy. It's no longer only for media people. Palestine is still there. Yes, the Zionist project managed to erase its name from the Atlas of the world, but in the digital world, we can get it. And we can get it in the right way, so the world will know about what's happening in Palestine, what happened, what's happening, and what should change. I do believe that trusted media content, accessible, can get us free Palestine. Thank you very much. Palestinian voices. Um, I'm very honored to be back in Istanbul. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Sami, the uh, Center for uh, Islamic and Global uh, Affairs, uh, Zaim University, but especially my thanks goes to the Turkish people. Because in all honesty, without the support of peoples around the world, from Turkey to Malaysia, to Indonesia, to uh, Brazil, to Chile, to South Africa, to France, Britain, the United States, and elsewhere, we wouldn't have a movement. We wouldn't have solidarity. We wouldn't have resources. We wouldn't have allies we wouldn't have the kind of potential that allows us to come together and to talk about strategies. In fact, as far as Israel is concerned, they had hoped that the Palestinians will just disappear. They never viewed us as Palestinians as a distinct nation to begin with. We were Arabs. And not Arabs as the Arab people, but Arabs as just you know, nomadic tribes that are constantly on the move. And Palestinians, after the Nakba, will find a home somewhere else. They will assimilate. They will move on. But we haven't. And the reason why we haven't is not because we have this incredible, savvy, strategic, visionary, forward-looking leadership. It's despite the fact that we have none of that. The reason we are still there, we're still talking about Palestine, we're still advocating the rights of the Palestinian people, is that because of the Palestinian people. And I think this is very important, the relevance of people to our discussions. Academic discourses sometimes can be quite disconnecting and alienating if they are not applied to real life situations. I think one of the last things that Edward Said warned from before he passed away was the fact that we are delving way too much in theory and we are forgetting that there are people, faces, names, and a reality that exist beyond theory. And academia moves so very slowly. It takes us a long time to adopt new technology, new terminology, and new, new theories, and new discourses. And by that time, things would have moved on, and so forth. I was going to start with a quote by Said. Then I thought, maybe Fanon, maybe Gramsci, maybe Hassan Kanatami. I like them all. It's really tough to choose. But then I decided to tell you more about this guy um, who can neither write or read. His name is Ali Abu Ghasib. Ali Abu Ghasib is, is not an intellectual, although Gramsci argued that each one of us is capable of being a public intellectual, even though we do not uh, uh, subscribe to that role. Uh, in society, but everyone is indeed capable of being intellectual, but, uh, but Ali is not. Ali is a fighter. Um, and um, I was introduced to Ali by a friend of mine, Yusuf al-Jamal, sitting over here. I think he's like one of the best kept secrets about Turkey. He moved to Turkey to do his PhD from Gaza. Brilliant scholar, and I think you should uh, absolutely. He has helped so many of us who are unable 
to give to God that connected us with Allah to people and made our work accessible and possible. So thank you, um, Yusuf, for all of that. He introduced me to this guy, his name is Ali al uh, Initially, I was writing a book called The Last Earth that came from last year. Um, I write in a genre that is called people's history. The reason I am so enchanted with this genre is I was born and raised in a refugee camp in Gaza myself. And when I left Gaza, I left the refugee camp in, uh, I was 22 years old at the time. I was absolutely astounded by that massive disconnect that, that exists between us in the refugee camp and the way that we are perceived elsewhere. And I'm not just talking about media and CNN and Fox News. I'm not talking about mainstream academia either. I'm also talking about people who perceive themselves to be in a better position to understand this. Even within our own solidarity movement, there was this massive disconnect. And for me, the references of the refugee camp were the refugees, their daily struggles, the memories of the Nakba, the fighters. My father was a freedom fighter. In fact, I wrote a book called My Father Was a Freedom Fighter. Um, I lived by the martyr's graveyard where all the kids who used to be killed in the Intifada were buried there. I went to Al Masjid al Kabir, the great mosque of Nusayrat, later renamed Al Qassam Mosque, and later bombed by the Israeli army in 2014. Two people were killed by my neighbors, and it's being rebuilt again. These were the references in my mind when I found myself kind of having to engage a community that is supposedly pro-Palestine. It was a bit confusing to me. To give you an example, I, moved to, I went to study at the University of Washington, and I attended this pro-Palestine meeting in Seattle. And one of the people suggested that we need to worry about the trauma that is experienced by Israeli soldiers in the occupied territories. There are victims too, that person said. Everybody nodded. And then they start talking about the Israeli trauma in victimizing the Palestinians. And nobody talked about the Palestinians. And then I found myself in this very surreal, strange world in which our narrative as a Palestinian people is marginalized, intentionally hidden, as if we are a liability to ourselves. We can't speak for ourselves, because we are going to say all sorts of things that are not consistent with what you should think of us. We are even marginalizing conferences sometimes that advocate Palestinian lives. Oftentimes, we find ourselves as sidekicks to someone else who is more equipped to tell our story because he is closer to the mindset. He can speak better to the mainstream, and therefore, we are constantly finding ourselves kind of bashfully fighting for space to tell our own story, you see? So we always need a buffer. We always need a buffer. And that is really not at all what life in Palestine is like. In reality, our references, our, our um, thing, our frame of reference, our discourses, our daily stories, our struggles, are not what is being portrayed of us. We are neither victims and by victims, I mean perpetual victims, as people who are embracing the role of the victims or just, just really constantly just being for international aid and food and medicine and that sort of thing. We've never actually adopted the role of the victim in our narrative. So if you understand an original Palestinian narrative, we do not draw, we do not write ourselves as victims. We do not assign that role to ourselves. And certainly, we are not terrorists. And that is not even part of any discourse that we discuss amongst ourselves. But here we are, finding ourselves oftentimes having to navigate the distance between the terrorist and the victim. 
This is why you have these things as, you know, you have even Palestinians finding themselves standing in Western platforms having to say, we are not all Hamas. Yeah. We haven't all elected Hamas as if Hamas is some sort of an alien invasion that came from outer space, imposed on the Palestinian people, not in any way an organic evolution of Palestinian culture, agree with it or disagree with it, this is your right. But that's not the, the issue. The fact is, Hamas is part of our society. As much as Fatah, as much as the Jabhah Shahiyya, the popular front for the liberation of Palestine, as much as everyone else, this is who we are, and this is our society. And you have to understand this according to our own terms. We don't need to adopt our discourse. Maybe we can use language that is relatable to you. But the discourse itself, the heart of the discourse, the core of the discourse is ours. And only us can determine its directions, its values, and its aspirations. So, this is all just to justify to you why I did not choose a, pari uh, uh, a quote by Pernod on Gramsci and Said, but rather that of Ali Abu Mughassi. So let me just read to you just a few passages uh, of Ali Abu Mughassi. Before I tell you, Ali was a prisoner in Syria. Um, during the um, uprising turn, civil war turn, regional war, Ali found himself are uh, free. He was freed. He ran away to Lebanon. The Lebanese caught him, shipped him to, God, uh, to Egypt. The Egyptians did not want him, so he ran away and he gets uh, 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 smuggled under the border, the Rafah uh, border, into Gaza, and he found himself there without his family. So the whole idea of why Yusuf connected me with Ali, the idea was maybe I can write an article. I have several articles that are published in various papers, and maybe we can write his story, and maybe somewhere, someone, somewhere, can actually locate Ali's family. That was the idea. But the story ended up being just way too fascinating that we decided to actually incorporate it into the book. Now, um, Ali was a sniper in Lebanon. And he fought the Israelis, and he fought, fought the Israelis in Lebanon, he fought them in Jordan. Uh, he actually went to Iraq at one point to fight the Americans. And I said, what were you doing in Iraq? I mean, this is not our fight. He went to Umm al-Qasrin, like when the war first started. Ali was there, he went with volunteers through the Syria border, went to fight in Iraq, and he said, we are Arabs, so that's what we do. We fight for each other. And it just puzzled me that Ali from Gaza found himself all the way south of Basra at the Kuwait border trying to stop the Americans from coming in. And I told him, how did, tell me about how did you learn to be a sniper? He said, oh, I learned from the best. There was a young man, he was far younger than all of us, um, but, uh, but he was very, very good. I said, what's his name? He said, Muhammad Barut. Really? I mean, tell me more about Muhammad Barud. He said, um, well, he was from Gaza, from the Nusa. I said, are you talking about my dad? Oh. So it turned out that my dad was a bad ass back in the day. Yes. And he told Ali Abu Ghassib how to be a sniper. Talk about positionality in activity. Right, so suddenly you're trying to be this kind of like, you know, tell me your story, I'm not gonna get too involved, and suddenly you find your, your father just jammed right in there, and he's kind of responsible of much of the mess that Ali has, has done. Um, so when I decided to tell Ali's story, and here's the thing that's really, really interesting about how ordinary people tell their stories. In, 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 whether in journalism, uh, which is kind of like short-term understanding of what's happening today within the context of last week and last month and maybe two years ago, or academia that kind of looks at a more more expansive discourse. In um, So when I approached this, I kind of was thinking of the same markers, you know? One state, two states, refugees, Nakba, 1967, before, after, the first intifada, second intifada, and try to kind of like fit the people in these little fragments. 
you know, in the name of I'm telling your story. But it turned out that they do not subscribe to any of that. To any of that. I spoke to, I'm getting you excited about Ali's quote. I will read the quote in a second. <laughs> I spoke to this lady, her, her name is Omar Wan al Assar. Omar Wan was my neighbor actually back in Gaza. She lost two loved ones that really lit a uh, market her heart. One was Salim, her brother, and the other was Kamal, her son. Kamal died as a result of torture by the Israeli army during the First Intifada. Salim disappeared in 1956, a long time ago. He was running away from the Israelis. We think that he might have been killed and buried in some orchard somewhere as he tried to escape Gaza. Whenever Amarwan speaks about them, she mixes, she mixes between their names. Now I thought, this is really interesting. Um Marwan is mixing up big time between dates. 1956, 1967, she keeps as like, Um Marwan, we are talking about the 1967 war. Why are you reverting back to 1956? It's like, I'm I'm old and I keep forgetting. I was like, did we make the right choice of talking to Um Marwan in the first place? But then, when it came to her family, her personal memories, and from the very early, one of the early memories of, of riding on, the, on, the, on a donkey, along with Salim, who died in 56, yeah, and escaping with their families, the Nakba. And, and the stories that they used to tell and the details of these stories. She knew what her kids were, were wearing when the Israelis came the first time and they broke down the house and they took Kamal out. Uh, yes, he, can, he was wearing a, a white shirt with, and I, I want details, and she knew all the details, but when it came to other areas, she was really mixing things up, and when it came to differentiating between two people who died decades apart, she kept mixing up, and I thought, it is because <coughs> grief tends to come from the same part of the memory, because for Omar Wan, the loss of Salim, the loss of Kamal, the loss of the homeland, the loss of hope, and the re resurrection of hope, it's all part of the same part of her brain that makes her who, the, who she is, and the fact that she carried on after all of these years, raising her, son, her, her, her grandsons all on her own. Now I'm thinking, Um Kamal cannot, uh, cannot read or write. She can't. But in my opinion, um, like numerous Palestinian women that you never hear of, their names are not indexed in any book. Um, they are not part of any discussion. Their quotes are hardly quotable. Yet in reality, they are the essence, the heart and mind of Palestine and the Palestinian people, they exemplify the true empowerment of Palestinian women, not as a separate discourse, not as a separate political discussion or entity, but rather as part and parcel of a larger discourse, and that is the discourse of the Palestinian people. Now that you're all excited about Ali Abu Basid's quote, <laughs> this is a letter, a long letter he wrote I wrote on his behalf to his daughter Hiba, his eldest daughter, hoping that maybe one day he will find his family. Hiba, I tried my hardest to shield you from all harm. You saw me in my heyday as a fighter in my military fatigue, but also as a broken man who worked under the burning sun as a manual laborer. My pocket hid the secret of a fake name on a false identity card. All the while, I was fighting for you. And I really thought we could win. I won't fantasize about our final trip to Palestine once it would be liberated. I imagined you wearing the robe I brought you from Burj al-Barajne 
embroidered with the colors of the flag. I imagined Ahmed as a fighter too. Wearing a khaki outfit adorned with a black and white kufiya, in that fantasy, I was always old, but strong enough to remember everything clearly. I would guide you through our village in Wadi Shalalha, in Bair Saba. This is where your grandfather, Aish, fell in love with your grandmother, Hamda, I would say. And he would smile and insist, I tell you the story all over again. And you needed to know every detail, from the color of the sky to the flowers that bloomed. He was a poor man too, a Bedouin, like me. And like me, he was short, dark, and wrinkled. But unlike me, he had little patience. His life was always hard. And when he was forced out of his village, that small piece of land we called Atur al Abyad, he lost his mind. He lost everything. I can assure you that Ali Um Hasib right now is joining the great march of return at the God of Israel. I'm sure of it. In fact, when he went back to Gaza, that was just before 2014, he decided he was going to join the resistance. So he goes to the Hamas fighter near Beit Hanun, and he volunteers his services. He's an old man. He's wounded. He can barely walk. And I said, oh, OK. So you went there, and you asked him. He said, yes, I, I want to die with a rifle in my hand. And I said, what did they say? He said, well, they bought me a kebab sandwich. And they sent me home. They said, you have fought for us. Now it's our turn. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately, that is really what the Palestinian discourse is. Ultimately, it's Omar Wana Asar, it's Ali Umar Asif, are the kids demonstrating. And just imagine this, just imagine this. And I know that I might have exceeded my time by now. But 70 years, generation after generation, the Zionists thought the whole thing is going to be sorted out. We just need the right peace agreement, the right proposal, the right, the right men you know, who would agree to do business with us. Notice how Americans always ask, who is the great man? Or who is the strong Palestinian we can speak with? They're always asking for a single person to sort out everything. Yet 70 years later, how many generations is that? Generations about 26 years, 27 years? I talk about several generations, yet you have children right now who have their ancestors lived in villages that have been destroyed, yet they are still standing there, aware of who they are, aware of where their families came from, aware of have the kind of political aspirations of wanting to go regardless of whether that is feasible or not feasible. That's a whole different discussion. It doesn't matter. Knowing who you are after all of these years and fighting for it and dying for it, that is the Palestinian discourse. I'm going to finish with that. I just want you just to remember this. Let the Palestinian people be the core of our understanding of Palestine. Any discourse, any discourse that lacks that centrality of the Palestinian people is not deserving of being a Palestinian discourse. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baloud. Finally, we welcome Mr. Frank Baba, who will speak on Palestine as a universal struggle for freedom. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, last speaker of the day, so um, I'm very glad you all, you know, still around. I can only see one person sleeping in the room, which is pretty good, you know. And, uh, I won't mention who he is. Um, so, um, yeah, I won't go over the 35 minutes that you have given. 
just kidding. No, I'd be, I'd be sure. So I'm very happy to, uh, to have been invited to speak uh, at this conference. It's, uh, it's really an honor to uh, share you know, this place and this panel with so many uh, speakers, some of whom have really influenced and have played an integral part into um, shaping my view of the Palestine question and into my activism in general. So I really want to thank again Linda, Riyad, Fadi, uh, the organizers, the interpreters, and of course uh, Dr. Samuel Arian for organizing this conference. So I've been asked to talk about global Palestine, and I'm, um, I'm very happy about this as well, because that's an issue I'm deeply involved in and, and connected in, interested in, and, and, in, and an issue that I'm very often thinking about, sometimes in an optimistic way, sometimes not. So, um, so uh, I think the, the Q&A after the questions would be very interesting as well, because I think as speakers, we, we have to learn as much from you than you have to learn from us. Uh, so the term global Palestine has been for a few years now an integral part of the dictionary, right? The lingo of the Palestine solidarity movement. But I'm not entirely sure we all agree on what we mean by global Palestine. I'm not sure what we mean, what definition. Um, I'm not sure we agree on the definition of the term. So what, what do we mean by global Palestine? So in my opinion, there's more than one layers associated with the term, and it's important to, to focus on all the layers, not on one of them. So I think we'll all agree that what's happening in Palestine has repercussions all around the globe, and that you know, what's, what takes place in this sort of tiny piece of land has a, a, a very global impact. Um, what's also evident is that many political actors are often involved in shaping the present and the future of, the, of this land. Um, so that very often the Palestinians are not part of the equation. They're not part of, they're not at the table um, when it's time to discuss their own future. As we've recently seen with uh, the Trump administration, as well as Netanyahu, and the Israeli government, they can take unilateral actions, um, radical actions on issues such, a, such as Jerusalem, such as the Golan Heights, sort of breaking a very long historical, even if fragile, consensus, with the Palestinians pretty much only left with their eyes to cry. Also, what's, what's, what is wrongly referred to as the international community, when actually we mean um, Western government, rarely rarely react to uh, such accent, actions with more than um, statements or soft condemnations. When it, while in fact Europe uh, has very concrete ways to influence the discussion and make Israel take responsibility for, for its actions. So what's happening on the ground, which is really the continuity of the Greater Israel Project that the Zionist movement had in mind at its, at its uh, inception, the ongoing settler colonial project of Israel, the annexation of all of what's left of Palestine, we know has a deep root and impact in international politics. But what's also clear, and it has been, and it's been more obvious in the last few years, is that these political decisions and actions are seen by many around the world as an ongoing injustice, and these actions infuriate, infuriate, and sometimes radicalize people in, in various ways. If we have a brief look at um, Netanyahu's recent re-election, and I'm not even talking about the fact that he got re-elected while facing very serious corruption charges, we, we can see that on the ground, the problem the Palestinians are facing is huge. The fact that during the election, at no time at all, the, the disenfranchisement of six million people, all under Israel's control, but that cannot vote, came into the equation. The Palestinians from the occupied territories or from 48 were simply absent, transparent during the whole process of the election. And in fact, that's what I'd like to focus on in the sort of next 15 minutes. The sort of duality of despair on the ground, where it seems that things are getting worse and worse, and the politics of hope that seems to happen at, a, at an international level. 
I'm not saying, obviously, there's no hope on the ground. And the Great March of Return, for example, is, is an incredible example of, of smooth resistance and hope. But I think when we talk about global Palestine, we have to also talk about global Israel. Because I think we are facing two types of globalizations that, even though totally different, can already be separated from one another. So on one side, we have global Israel. Uh, Israel is exporting its knowledge of urban warfare uh, and control and security all over the world. Israel is very proud of um, using Gaza and, and the, the West Bank as a, as a sort of laboratory in, it, in its experiment. They're supplying arms to various police around the world, including the Brazilian police in the favelas. They're providing experts um, on, build, you know, on how to build walls you know, everywhere, you know, wherever one wall is needed. And Israel is all on, all on paper, all but on paper, part of Europe, with all the advantages it entails in terms of agreements, uh, research agreements, and the rest. Also, something that is very real and very felt, at, at least, I think, in Western societies, and something we, as people that live in, in, in the West, have to be very realistic on is that the Israelization of a society of a societies is very real. Recently, sort of, you know, when um, terrorist acts were committed in France, in, in Paris, um, I was listening to France Inter, one of the you know main radio stations, and every day you could be sure you had an Israeli expert on the radio with the with the commentator asking him. You guys know how to deal with this type of terrorism. How do you do it? So I think it's very scary because, like, when we say you know Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East, we all sort of laugh about it. But in fact, Israel might be a democracy if we accept this sort of new neoliberal definition of democracy throughout the world. Israel might actually be a model for what democracies are going to look like in the future. A new form of democracy where the, the, the demos, the people, won't have any power anymore. And for example, Professor Pape, who unfortunately had to leave, uh, he reminded us today how important language and, and semantics have been in the story of the Palestine question. And while we as activists, as, as Ilan mentioned, I'll have to use a new dictionary, it's important also to keep in mind that Israel is also producing its own sort of authoritarian new dictionary that is more and more adopted by, at least by Western governments. So the global Israel movement is what I would call sort of international, reactionary, and fascist globalism. Uh, with the Trump, the Sisi, the Orban, Bolsonaro, Duterte, Bin Salman of this world, um, and Israel has always been part of this movement. Israel has never been in its history on the way of, so of social justice and hope. On the other hand, we have global Palestine. With the growth of Palestine solidarity movements around the globe, um, with the growth of the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement, the inter intersectional links uh, made with the Black Lives Matter movement in the US, the rise of progressive voices inside the US Congress, that are slowly shifting the conversation in the US to, to the left, and the vibrant activism um, in Europe and US campuses. And I think global Palestine is really sort of about another world um, and can apply to various social justice movements that are happening at an international level. And when I think about Palestine um, in a global way, I think that Palestine is a window towards a better world. It's also um, a window on what's wrong with the world right now, but it can be a window of possibilities of what we together can, can make to not only make, not only free Palestine, but I think free ourselves also for various forms of, of, of oppressions. So in this regard, the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement, the BDS movement, has been key and very important um, in making the links between Israel's oppression and other states and institutions have support for this oppression. Because I think, you know, when, like before the BDS movement at various conferences, people come to you and ask, look, I'm Italian, I'm Greek, what, what, what can I do? You know, I'm not Muslim, I'm not Jew, I'm not 
Palestinian military, what can I do about Palestine? Now with the BDS movement, when you explain that your government is, if Israel is the thief, your government is the one providing the car, you know, when the bank has been sort of robbed or something, or the government is providing the dip diplomatic impunity. So you have to do something, you know, this is part of a, a global movement and you have a role to play. So I think the BDS movement has been key in sort of rejuvenating the movement and re-empowering people that you can do something. It's, it's about the world we live in in, in general. And I see BDS as, a, as politics of empowerment, really. Um, if I had to focus right now on uh, one aspect of BDS, um, I think for practical reasons, uh, it'd be the, the B, the boycott. Sanctions uh, will come later, inshallah, and they depend on states and institutions. Divestment is key and it's happened all over the world, but it's also about financial power more than anything. And I think in terms of boycott, what, I, what has hurt Israel the most in recent years is the cultural and academic boycott. The fact that so many well-known artists and academics uh, are now clearly taking a stand and refusing to play or go to Israel is massive because it also affects the consciences of the people on the ground. Also, the artists are very important for the movement, for ourselves. And as uh, Dr. Rabba Abdulladi mentioned this morning, the artists are the ones that can allow us to imagine what might be possible. You know, they, they are the ones that can free our imagination. Um, and they've been key in past struggles. Obviously, you can think about Emory Douglas for the, the Black Panther Party, you know, Najir Ali for Palestine, and they will be in the future as well. So when they make, take a stand and they say, we are artists, but before anything, we are citizens, and what, we say, what we're seeing in Palestine you know, is wrong and we'll take a stand against it, is very important. Um, so this movement, um, is sort of contrary to the first one, um, is a social, intersectional, internationalist, and inclusive, inclusive sorry, form of global, global realism. I have a problem with my word. Um, I think the biggest movement, the biggest problem, sorry, uh, the first global movement of the fa fascist, racist, and authoritarian ones, the Trump and the Kanye is facing is, is quite simple. Despite the huge disparity of financial, military, and political power, the Palestinians are staying. Call it sumud, call it resistance, call it whatever you want. It's pretty clear. You know, it's their home, their land. They're not moving. And I think that the, the, the powers like realize that, and they are pretty desperate. You know, and that's why I think the Israeli society and the Israeli government. Is what someone I can't even say like said like Israel we created a monster. But you know if you take you know um, a lion that is scared, it's going to do lots of crazy things. You know a lion in a cage when he feels he's desperate, he's going to no exit. He's going to do even more crazy things than than before. I think Israel is at this point. They do feel despite their, their you know bragging about the opposite that they are very being cornered. And I think that's why, as again Arabab said before. We're probably gonna have, it's probably going to have to get worse before it gets better. But it might be soon that it's going to get better. Again, okay, inshallah. Um, so, the second movement, the progressive, inclusive one, our movement, hopefully, is facing the challenge of, um, of time and resilience, I guess. How long is it going to take for things to not only get better away from Palestine, but for actually positive changes to happen on the ground. And I think that's also a huge question and not we shouldn't, you know, and one we shouldn't sort of underestimate. I personally know, and I'm sure we all know, so many activists and even Palestinians on the ground that have sort of had enough and that have understandably have sort of stopped resisting. And again, um, as to, I think as international and I, and I sometimes hear that, you know, I go to Ramallah, it seems that people are happy, you know, they're like, okay, they've, they've taken a few checkpoints out, you know, that's the best we can expect for, and now we're we partying and stuff. And people from the outside criticizing what some people in the Frankfurt and Ramallah are doing is very problematic, because uh, I remember my friend with the Saleh Habuishle talking to me about the demonstrations in Nablus, you know, the peaceful demonstrations, and that always ended with Israeli snipers shooting people, shooting people, torturing people, you know, 
jailing people. So after a while, when you've seen your, your dad go to jail, when you've, when you've been tortured by Israel, when you've seen your house destroyed five times, and it's been 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, you can understand what someone would say, look, the checkpoint doesn't work anymore, halas, I'm okay with that. So that's something we have, we, we have, to, to, we have not to be shy about, and to, we have to talk about. See, I've pretty much finished. Um, so just to wrap up, because I think it's, again, I want to leave as much time to the, the question as well. We also have to, uh, again, I think Ramzi was mentioning that sometimes the media talks about, when the media talks about history, they talk about yesterday and maybe the week before. But we have to remember as, as, as a movement, as activists, that history goes, you know, goes back 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And if history has taught us something, in the case of South Africa and, and many other like national liberation movements, is that at the end of the day, people's power wins, and oppression falls. And I think right now, we have to embrace the, the, the struggle, and we have to rejoice on, on sort of small victories, and on this pretty exhilarating journey that we're all together in, right? It's not very often in these in this sort of societies, individualistic societies, that you can be hand in hand with a woman, a man, a Palestinian, a Jew, a Muslim, a French guy, an Italian guy, and work together on the same goal toward, toward the same future. So I think this journey that we all have sort of embarked um, upon, and hopefully we lead the Palestinians and ourselves to freedom, is something we should really embrace and, um, and, and celebrate. Shukran. received a message that we should work to end the on time as much as possible. So um, I'd like to shortly open the floor for questions and answers from the audience. Um, please keep your questions and comments. I kindly ask uh, to no more than 90 seconds uh, for the sake of really maximizing the time and to allow as many questions uh, as possible. So do we have, are we, microphones, okay. We'll open the floor now for questions. We're in need of a translation for this particular question. So if anyone is willing to volunteer. Oh, thank you. Okay. Ee, kısa bir soru. Ee, çok e, haklı bir şeyden bahsetti. Ee, eksik bıraktığımız bir alanda. Filistin'deki mücadeleleri dünyada pek çok vicdan sahibi insanlar <gülüyor> karşı çıkıyorlar. She mentions that uh, you uh, addressed well points and that there's some things that you've missed. You said that it's important to get artists on our side, uh, but what happens in time is they have to face the consequences. Uh, what happened with the names that she mentions? Maybe uh, there should be things where we can support them as well and not leave these names mentioned alone. Okay, thank you. We'll take some more questions. Oh, okay, I'll open the floor. Thank you. Okay, gentlemen in the stripes. 
So actually my question is for uh, Dr. Ramsey first. Uh, you said that the fight for Palestine is not just for Palestine, it's for all the Arab, for the opposite. So <clears throat> what I want to ask, why the world keep ignoring this? Like I'm from Egypt, last thing I hear, uh, a party was coming from the con for the Congress, from uh, the protesters, and what the, the guys in the parliament say, you should follow what the president Sisi said about the Islam. And they actually weren't talking about this. That's like my question, why they keep ignoring us and they keep opening another thing that we are not talking about. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Directly, my question to Dr. Lubna. Um, you mentioned a lot about um, the, the role of yours during the history of the Palestinian movement. But was, I was actually waiting to listen what is the role now for the, the youth now. So my question is, what is the role of um, the youth um, in the life of two major trends now? The first one is the decentralized and horizontalized uh, and leaderless movement of, uh, of youth, uh, which I derived um, from the Twitter and Facebook, etc. And um, the declining belief in the political uh, parties as, as well as uh, political organization. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the word. My name is Ismail Tezan. Uh, I've lived in the UK for 30 years. I've currently been living in Istanbul for three years now. Uh, we all know that BDS is feared by the occupation of force, and they clamp down on objects against its fighters. But when I speak to tradesmen about boycotting and the consumers, I get mi mixed comments, such as the, com the consumer says, we boycott one product, and we're using another product. The tradesman argues, uh, we can't find the same fine, uh, type of products. Uh, another point of view for my household is we want to boycott one product, but then we find our washing machine is this, and then we try to dilute ourselves from boycotting that, and we can't find the same quality. So we as a public, my question is this. It, we need a, a project and a, a plan, and what can we do more kind of strategically to actually, actually combat this BDS? Because we know from the past as well, from all of these kind of uh, zulum that is going in the world, that this is the biggest fear, BDS, the economy crisis. So inshallah, you could, one of the uh, speakers can uh, answer my question. Okay, thank you. Um, our sister and the uh, my name is Sarah Hassan. I have a question for Dr. Lubna Piani. Um, do you think that the PYM would have been successful, or relatively successful, if the Arab Spring had not interrupted it? Thank you very much. My name is Saad Wihizna. I would like to comment, to comment, to connect uh, the, the different lectures from all Friends, um, you know, Rowan said, produce, advocate, and network. I think I made that word. But I would like to say uh, about globalizing the struggle of Palestine and global Palestine, as Frank, uh, my dear friend Frank Barat said. I have a friend, his name is Mike Collins. He wrote a book called Global Palestine. And it's really amazing. I met uh, uh, Mike Collins like 17 years ago, and I forgot that I met him actually, held or not. And, by meeting and introducing him to the camps and many other things, he ended up like, I contributed a lot to, to, to the production of this book, Global Palestine. And this is the issue of the power of networking and bringing people together. Just giving you an example, another example, and uh, I'm not gonna talk too long, but because I think it's very important. I had another friend, his name Michael Kennedy. He came to Palestine and he said, please uh, take me to al Farah prison. Al Farah prison, I was in, in that prison and I was tortured like three, four times. And I said, I cannot, I, you know, I don't know how if I want to take you because I, I haven't been there in 23 years. I don't know how, the, how would I feel. But then you know, he pressured me and pressured me and I took him to Al Farah prison and I had flashback and, I, and he started writing and, and, and recording notes and taking photos, taking photos and taking video. And then ended up 
the first master's degree, he was in AUC in Cairo, produced on Al Farah prison. And now, now he's doing his PhD, he's an anthropologist, on Al Farah prison. On Al Farah prison. Um, so this brings me to the issue of the last thing is youth. Our youth are disconnected, you know, empowering the people's voices. We have youth in our universities uh, who are actually in the struggle, who go through the checkpoints, who, are, who go to jail, who get, who get uh, uh, shot and tortured or, or, or maimed or, or, or killed or assassinated. And their voices, as our friend Ramzi Brutford, are not the ones that are heard. And these voices that should be heard in poetry, in, in, in film, in, and that's what's amazing about your work, Rowan. I read, I'm, I'm overwhelmed actually by the, <laughs> the totality of this amazing panel. And I just wanted to bring this power networking, bringing all these voices into the world, but in a very powerful way. And this, I really thank you. I just wanted to say this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rami from Jordan. Um, my question is um, to uh, Rowan, Ramzi, and Frank, maybe, for all of the media. Um, so yesterday, yesterday, somebody commented on the fact that uh, we need a Palestinian Mandela, and then Mr. Mandela responded with the fact that the ANC could not have defeated the apartheid without the uh, uh, sacrifices of so many people that we don't know. And this reminds us of the saying um, that history is made by the, by the, uh, the millions of unknown and nameless people. Um, what can you do um, with your work to shed light on the activities and the activisms of many, many, many citizens and of different countries inside and outside Palestine who are doing things um, to support the cause, who, ha who can become small icons for other youth and other people to uh, to follow, um, and thus creating the uh, the feeling that we are not helpless, that people have done this here and others have done this there, and this uh, creates the uh, inspiration for the for the youth who are looking at the cause and seeing uh, not much they can do. Thank you. And then in the back, the panelists are here. Salam to all. I would like to to comment on on what Mr. Barwood uh, uh, said about uh, the necessity of of uh, I think to to be the, the leaders and to, to to be the leaders of their own struggle and their own narrative. Uh, mostly in the in the West, they the even in, within the solidarity movement, you have uh, plenty of uh, of speakers who are not actually Palestinian, who are, their voices are, are let's say, uh, um, uh, seen as, uh, as um, relevant, m much, much more than, much more than Palestinian voices. I mean, could be, could be European, could be Israelis, could be Jews, American Jews, and uh, maybe, maybe it's a kind of, a, of, Let's say racism, or I don't, I don't know, maybe on European Eurocentrism, something like that. I mean, related. And uh, what can we do to push for the, the Palestinian voices? This is the, the my first question. And uh, let me uh, allow me, uh, Mr. Barrow, to to disagree on, on the on the word you, the word you use about the the Gaza border. The, if you talk about the Israeli fence, so the border, we, could, we, we had a, that, uh, that discussion about, uh, about the wording with Professor Papi. And uh, this, secondly, uh, to, to Mr. Barad and to all of us, um, um, I mean, as a non Palestinian, as a French activist, I mean, it's, it's uh, as important for me to push for the, the, the Palestinian uh, message. As, uh, as for them, because I'm, um, it's my duty as, as a European taxpayer, at least, you know, if I, if I don't do that, I'm complicit, I don't want to, to, 
my, I don't want my money to be to be used against the Palestinians because it won't, I would be the next one on the list. This is first point. And secondly, I don't want to allow neither 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 the Israeli government to the embassy, nor my own government, to silence my voice or my or, or to to obstruct or to limit my 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 democratic rights and my democratic uh, liberty, uh, right to, and, and right to, to, to defend to defend and to to push forward the, the Palestinian narrative. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We'll allow our panelists to respond. It was a long list of questions, and we'll see if we can take another round if possible. But uh, yes. My name is from Gaza. It's over there. I want to ask a question. Okay. يعني إذا كان سأحاول الحديث بالعربية مرة أخرى عندي سؤالين بستغل الدكتور رمزي إنه أعطانا فرصة لهالسؤال الموضوع الأول برجع إنه اليوم قد إيه بتغير أدوات العمل الفلسطيني بالنسبة لك ما بين جوا لما كنت بالمخيم وبالأرض المحتلة وأنت لا زلت متابع كيف الناس تشتغل جوا وما بين كيف تشتغل برا اليوم أنا بالنسبة لي الأمر صعب يعني بس لك شوان شخصي قد كان الامر صعب بالاربع سنين اللي عم بتم بالخارج. السؤال الثاني لدكتور اصلاح حول موضوع النسوي الفلسطيني، في بلحظ او هل هناك انفصال بين الحركه النسويه الفلسطينيه اللي هي دائما موضع البحث وموضع الحديث وبين المراه الفلسطينيه والقائعه النسويه؟ بالضبط شكرا. بالضبط شكرا. بالضبط شكرا. بالضبط شكرا. بالضبط شكرا. على عكس الحركة النسوية الفلسطينية اللي تراجعت زي ما احنا عارفين بالسنوات الأخيرة، بس فينا نشوف مثلا مئات الطالبات والشابات هن عماد الحراك بال 48 لمقاطعة انتخابات الكنيسة أو عشرات خلينا نقول بتفتح بال 48 الحراك التضامن مع الضباب الأسرى في فتيات تقدموا محتل المواقع محترمة جدا وكويسة، في عنا بحالة غزة ومسيرات العودة كان آلاف النساء كانت بيشاركن والنساء تقليديات ما بمثل يعني ما بمثل صورة الحركة النسوية الفلسطينية بالمعنى التحرري الليبرالي كذا، خلينا نشوف انه في من ستريم حاطط معايير بايش لازم تكون المرأة الفلسطينية وما بين المرأة الفلسطينية فعليا، المرأة الفلسطينية وين بتنشط سياسيا وين بتتقدم وين كذا وين واقعها مش مهم، المهم هل الحركة النسوية الفلسطينية تقدمت؟ لا أو اه، أنا بالنسبة لي مش مهم يعني، هنا السؤال هل باتت الحركة النسوية الفلسطينية هي معيق للجهد النسوي للجهد لجهد المرأة الفلسطينية أو قيمتها أو استغرى بتحجب عنها المرأة شكرا You know why? Why the demobilization? Why women's movement are not um, anymore uh, in direct contact with uh, you know the constituencies or the women uh, at the grassroots? So uh, yes, there is uh, um, the organization supposed to represent women in general are in crisis and their organizations are facing lots of problems, whether because of their enjoyization or whatever. And I try to shed some light on the Islamist uh, women that uh, as a movement they are emerging, but they are also uh, facing a problem not to be able to represent all women. So they are representing a category or a group of, of women and uh, they are uh, more successful in the sense that they uh, link their uh, movement with the question of the national struggle. And I have uh, just a few words about the boycott. Uh, the boycott, before it, 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 it is considered as uh, an efficient economic tool to make Israel Israeli economy lose, more importantly is is to create the culture of boycott. It is. It, it doesn't matter if you boycott this product 
and you need to buy another product or whatever, but it is important to have in mind the culture of boycott that this NPD should be punished, you know, in a way or another. Uh, so thank you for the questions. Um, I'll answer the question about the role of youth now, and specifically the question of decentralized movement of youth and decline in belief in the political parties. Um, I mean, I think I, I maybe didn't, you know, foreground my bias and my orientation in the talk. You know, I, I, I recognize that the main role for youth today, whether they're inside Palestine or outside, is in political activity, is a decentralized role. But I did try to like tend to the question of an escalation of political activity at all levels. So whether they're prisoners or cultural workers or, or writers or academics or um, people going out into the streets in protests or people you know in the Shata, in the far exile waging um, boycott divestment sanctions campaign, I think that there is an escalation of youth political activity that we haven't seen in the aftermath of the Oslo Accords period. And it's not just about youth, it's about the Grand Solidarity Movement globally, it's about Palestinian communities globally engaging in, in all of these different forms. But I, I really am someone who um, maybe is nervous about the conflation of activism with political organization. And I know that because of the Palestinian political situation today, we are revering and we're celebrating the, the expansion of activism that's happening globally. And I think that this is important. It's creating consciousness, it's creating more global allies, it's creating more resources and opportunities, it's putting pressure on, on Israel, it's exposing them, and it's forcing them to concede to someone or something. But the question is, in the absence of political organization within Palestinian national politics, I don't know who it is that one day when the moment is ripe with possibility, the Israelis are gonna be forced to concede to. How are the Palestinians building their decolonial trajectory? I have an understanding of how Palestinians and their allies are building an anti-colonial uh, activism on a, uh, on a global level, but the national strategy, which um, the earlier panel spoke to today, it's not something we can evade. We can't just evade it by celebrating, you know, an Arab idol star who's singing about Palestinian blood. <laughs> I'm being facetious, by the way. So, um, the second um, thing that I want to talk about in terms of the decline of the belief in political parties, it's true. Palestinian youth um, are developing more of an overt expression of antagonism to the political parties. I find this to be very dangerous because in, simultaneously in their critique of the political parties and the political establishment, what they're also critiquing is institutional forms of politics. And so they're negating an entire rich legacy and history that we have as Palestinians in, in our anti-colonial struggle that we can learn from by saying, you know, we don't want political parties, we don't want organizations, you know, and, and kind of privileging the more individual forms of activism over community account, like accountable forms of politics. The last question about do I think the PYM would have been successful if the Arab uprisings didn't happen? Um, I don't know, it's a very complicated and difficult question. Um, I would say that um, I, I don't know what successful is or isn't, and I, I think that PYM's experience was a reflection of the Palestinian condition during those years. Um, but I think one thing that that moment did teach me as a member who was in the PYM is that there is something particular about a community of people whose political strategies and resources and ideas and thoughts and, and like trajectories are interrupted by regional and global changes in power, unpredictable things, unpredictable variables that we, we didn't see. And that actually helped me have a lot more empathy for former generations, including my grandfather's generation. It, it, it helped me understand the Palestinian condition across time and place, that there are things that we can plan for that in the absence of having our own landmass we cannot totally account for. In many ways, we're at the whims of different players. Um, and the second thing that I would say is that um, I think it was a, like a, a moment that reflected that we need a particular calculus of things to come together, uh, a regional moment that's ripe with possibility, preparedness of our organizations, a revolutionary consciousness within our community, a strategy, resources, alliances, and we just didn't have that calculus in that moment. So successful or not, whether we failed or not, I'm not sure, but I think that um, 
I think so long as we can take the lessons away from the PYM experience and find a way to institutionally pass them down to new generations, um, that that for me is what's important for me. Thank you very much. Uh, we are really lucky to be in this conference. It doesn't happen every day to have all this discussion. It's also difficult to absorb everything and, and um, comment on it. Um, let's, uh, two points, three quick points. The first is since uh, Lubna and Helga mentioned Kustan Zin Drek yesterday and today, I would love to mention Najib Massar and Sadej Bahai. As uh, uh, Dr. Hani in the session before the lunch said 102 years of struggle, I think even more, yeah. uh, Najib Nassar started 1909 uh, in talking about Zionism and his wife, Sadej Bahai, was the first Palestinian woman from Acre that the British mandate got her into the prison for one and a half year. So we have the role models. Maybe the stories are not well um, uh, circulated enough, they are documented, but maybe not in an audiovisual uh, capacity. And this brings me to Rami's question, how we can document all of those things. We cannot depend on professional media people and ask them to document these things. I think every one of us is responsible. I'm very sad when I meet people who did not document their own family stories, their grandparents, their people. You can document in a professional, passionate way. Now with the technology, you can document things, audio and video, you can at least document the things. Um, uh, oral history projects have been going on since the 70s. A lot of projects, AUB now have 3,000 hours of audiovisual material about Palestine Music University started from the 70s. But also we are losing a lot of things because we as people are not documenting things enough. And later we'll find incredible smart people like Ramzi to transfer those stories into real international capacity stories and audiovisual things. So I think my advice is knowledge is very important in these days. Every one of us can do something to empower what can happen. Plus, be professional and passionate, and we can reach the sky. Thank you. I don't want to be professional as well and keep track of all my comments. Now I can't eat with my <laughs> own handwriting. Um, uh, but I do my best. Uh, regarding, regarding BDS, I think we have to think of BDS um, um, more than just you know, a practical mechanism to hold Israel accountable. Uh, because there's always a question as well, no matter how much money Israel is going to lose, the Americans will give it to them on the other hand, so what's the point? Um, I think it's important that we note that one of the, uh, the main Israeli endeavors, political endeavors from the very, very beginning was to legitimize Israel as, as an actual state, as a member of the international community, um, and so forth. And they have failed. This is why, you know, when Benjamin Netanyahu comes and says, BDS trying to delegitimize Israel, don't say no. Yes, that's precisely what we are trying to do. But we are not trying to delegitimize Israel uh, because we are picking on Israel, we are trying to delegitimize Israel because Israel is an apartheid, settler colonial regime that deserves to be marginalized, that deserves to be isolated, that deserves to be delegitimized. Um, now, how does this relate to hummus? The way it relates to hummus is that when you go to a grocery store and you look at the various products, and you realize that this is an Israeli product, and you make the conscience decision. Now, of course, I am, again, being facetious, and I don't mean hummus as hummus, I mean that as a representation of everything else. When you make that decision, that I will not buy this Israeli product, you are engaging with the Palestinian people. You are no longer someone who is sitting, watching TV, saying that there is nothing we can do about it, or desperately trying to, like, how can an ordinary person in this country or that contribute to this? It's hopeless. It's been going on for a thousand years. No. You can actually refrain from buying the Israeli Hamas. And the moment you do that, you're engaging with our movement. Now, I think BDS is far more intellectual movement than it is actually a practical boycott. 
Because what happens when BDS becomes the center of the conversation, we are finally having a conversation. Because you see, for so many years, they did not even acknowledge that we existed, let alone that we had a narrative, let alone that we require remedy of some kind. Now, they want to talk to us. Is there one major American university that did not engage with the issue of BDS? No. And regardless of the outcome, regardless of the resolution regarding B BDS passes or doesn't pass, it doesn't matter because we are having a conversation and we are finally at the center of this discussion and we are finally creating alternatives until our people back at home go through this transition, we are going through this gap, this political gap. You can classify it in any way you want. It's not the end of the world from a historical point of view. Any national liberation movement went through such historical gaps. We're not the exception. But what that is being articulated, and it will be ultimately the Palestinian people who will make that decision, we are creating a global movement that is fighting Israel at every street corner, in every American, Canadian, Brazilian, African, Malaysian, Chinese city. We are there. We are there in the, the BDS, the anti, uh, the, the Israel apartheid week, hundreds of cities get involved, get engaged in the conversation. We protest sometimes in our dozens, sometimes in our thousands, but we are out there. And BDS has created that momentum for us. This is why it's so very important that we engage with BDS with the right understanding of what BDS is actually trying to achieve. Um, regarding the, the um, solidarity in the Arab world, um, I think we have to be very careful here. We can't allow the cause of Palestine to be hijacked by this corrupt regime or that. We see what's happening right now with the so-called deal of the century, where few Arab sellouts trying to organize some sort of an arrangement with Kushner in some yacht somewhere trying to sell the Palestinian cause. We, we have to be smarter than this to say, well, it is the cause of the Arabs, not in the sense that Saudi Arabia can decide what happens to my family in Gaza. We don't mean it that way. But solidarity is you. Solidarity is your people, my people. How many Egyptians died for Palestine? And I mean really, truly died for Palestine. How many, how many Arab from Iraq to Yemen to Sudan, you know that the, the leader of of the, uh, the, uh, the, the Arab army that was defending my village back in Beit Daras uh, in Palestine in 1948 was from Sudan. Was from Sudan. And he was killed there. And he would not retreat. And he fought until the very end. How do I look at that Sudani, um, the Sudani people, and say, yeah, your solidarity means to me as much as solidarity coming from somewhere else? No, your solidarity is special because you are part and parcel of my culture my history, my awareness, and my identity. And we cannot compromise on that. No matter what happens, CC or no CC, our faith is the same, our plight is the same, and our aspirations are the same. Um, and the final point regarding um, how do you stay connected, I mean, you know, especially us refugees, I'm really not trying to prejudice against those who are not Palestinian refugees, we have this thing, you know, we call it al waja you know? That original pain that we have as Palestinians who lived in refugee camps and we know, we know what it feels like, we know what it is like. When we, um, uh, there was a young man who was killed yesterday, he was a 16-year-old a kid, this beautiful, handsome young man, you know, you see that, and what do we think of Arafat? Because we lived right very close to each other. We had the martyrs' graveyard. How many children from our neighborhood and from the Nusayrat refugee camp were buried in the martyrs' graveyard? You see that, you're not relating to this as a human being, you are related to this as your neighbor. Because we've seen what happened to Ra'id in Oneness, we've seen what happened to Ala al Jiyawi. These were our friends and neighbors, and they all went through this process. So no matter how far you are, you can always believe in a very intimate and a very personal level. Thank you.
So I'll answer the first question about artists and uh, something that I missed. I mean, I didn't really miss it, just I didn't have time to fully expand on this, but I totally agree that artists that are going to take a stand for Palestine have to be aware that, we'll, that they will face consequences. And we have, as activists, to create a safe space for them to engage to engage in, um, in uh, let's say, pro-Palestinian or pro-justice activism. And believe me, that, that's what we're doing, or we're trying to do you know, most of the time. I'll, I'll take a brief example. Ken Loach, for example, the British film director, who is one of the most well-known vocal supporters of Palestine, it didn't take a week or something to bring him on. You know, he was one of the first jury member of the Russell Tribunal in Palestine. We took him to meetings with jurists, lawyers, activists, Palestinian filmmakers, and, and years after year, you know, year after year, he got more and more radical because also he was more and more aware of what was happening on the ground, and he felt he had the knowledge to actually respond to pretty much any attack on, on the topic. So this is a very long process. And that's why sometimes um, people don't have to, to rush to conclusions too quickly, you know. And art, you cannot ask, I mean, if you feel like an artist is on the verge of coming on board, you are going to talk with him about settlements, you know. Because you have to be very pragmatic. If, you, if someone is nearly, you know, coming on board and you straight away tell him you have to sign his boycott letter, this is an apartheid state, even if it's true, you're going to lose him or her. You need to be, do, you know, you need, it's, it's an educational process. It needs to be very graduate, and it takes time. So uh, about the, the boycott question, the fact that, you know, you boycott one product, and then there's another one you need to boycott. And boycott is, um, is about education, you know, and, it's, and sometimes, again, as activists, I can see this pamphlet with that, you know, here is the product you have to boycott, and it's like pretty much every product that's in your house. <laughs> so, um, and this is, this doesn't work. This is like, if someone is not aware of the conflict and stuff, if you take, you know, you have to boycott your toothpaste, you have to boycott your shampoo, you have to boycott your hummus, you have to boycott avocado, you know, you push them away. It's, it's, it's an educational uh, tactic. You need, again, to take it one step at a time. But as Ramzi said, and I totally agree, as soon as you start boycotting, even if it's an avocado, even if it's an orange or something, you are you know, embracing the Palestinian struggle. Uh, a, a brief example, one of my friends, who's not an activist at all, he's a, he's a translator, I know obviously that I support Palestine and stuff, and I think he sort of understands what's happening on the ground, but he's not really an activist. Recently told me he got an offer to translate the El Al website, the Israeli... Um, uh, Ella, the Israeli airline company. And he was very happy to tell me on WhatsApp, you know, they asked me to, trans to translate El Al, and I refused. I mean, he didn't go further than that. He didn't explain to them why he refused. But I think it's, you know, it's always a first step. I mean, it's with your parents, your family and stuff. It's always, but like, when I came back from Palestine for the first time, and I had, like, pictures, I had videos, I had... My dad, even with the evidence, because of years also of brainwashing by the media, wouldn't believe me. I was, he was like, this is science fiction. I said, no, this is real. And that's the proof. And that was your proper opinion. And it took, it took a few years to, you know, where you're seeing at the sort of 8 p.m. news, is not the truth, you know. So again, it's, it's, a, it's, you know, it's a process. You, you can't rush it. And uh, to finish, Rami, the question about, yeah, millions of people make history, not a Mandela or a Gandhi or something. Uh, I obviously totally agree, and Angela Davis, for example, is one of, who co constantly say, like, you know, this is not about me, this is about the hundreds of people that, that demonstrated to take me out of jail, etc. Uh, so it's very important, obviously, to tell, you know, and Howard Zinn, the late US historian, wrote this magnificent book, you know, a, U a People History of the United States of America. So, yeah, it's, it's key to tell the story of these people. And actually, I mean, I'm not Howard Zinn or anything, but I'm, I'm making a documentary right now about the Palestinian Solidarity Movement to show all these people that are involved, whether they're in Italy, in the US, in South Africa, with, a, with someone that Dr. Alarian knows very well, uh, his, his son, Ali. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a very stimulating, great panel, which I enjoyed very much.
Uh, indeed, Palestine is a global struggle. It has a role for women and men and, and youth. And it's a global struggle. It has media aspects, political, legal, and all. Um, when Ramsey was, was mentioning in his comments, it uh, came to me that after the 1948 Nakba, my father was was fighting and he was injured and he didn't know what happened to his brother who went north fighting. And it took him about a year and a half trying to find out what happened to him because he had no idea what happened to him. So he went from country to country asking people. Finally, he was able to locate where he died in battle. And next to him was a Bosnian and a Yemeni. All three died together in May of 1948, or July 1948. At any rate, I want to thank Islah, Lubna, Awan, Ramzi, and Frank for a great, great panel. Thank you very much.